Hey, hey, hey. All right. First of all, can y'all hear me? Can y'all hear me? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me and if you can see me. Thumbs up in the comments. Let me know. Okay, perfect. Um, let's go ahead and turn up. Turn the volume up. Not like me, whatever. Okay, cool. Yes, awesome. Yay. Okay. Welcome, 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 everybody. I was just about to say it's NCLEX Jeopardy, it's Tease Tuesday, but it's not. This is our first live webinar for all you lovely members of the study bar community. All right, this is members only. This is members only. So everybody that's not a member, I'm so sorry. You missed out on some good information. All right, so today we are covering how to answer select all that apply questions or multiple response. Um, let me go ahead and bring up our how are you guys doing today? How are you guys doing today? First of all, just in case nobody knows each other, introduce yourselves in the comments really quick. I'll go first. Hello, my name is Nurse Sam. I am the CEO and founder of Nurse Sam Global Media, as well as the Study Bar Community. It is for, um, it's, a, it's our monthly membership for nursing students, RN or LPN, does not matter. Um, and we are dedicated to making sure you guys thrive and survive throughout nursing school and have a sense of community so we can all um, get through this thing we call nursing school together, as well as promote fun slash happy studying, okay? Uh, tell me about you guys. What's your name? Where you're from? I am. I'm putting this. Okay. Right. It's a. Wait, it's a secret society. All we ask is trust. So don't share the link. <laughs> don't share the link. But yes, tell me about you guys. I had. I see. Um, Tamora, Leela, C. Hello, hello. Hello, soon to be Narcy. Hey, tomorrow from Dallas. What's up? What's up? Hey, Leela, graduated. So you're a um, graduate nurse. Um, graduate nurse Leela graduated um, in January. So now we're just waiting for an NCLEX. Hey, Melissa from Chicago. What's up? What's up? Okay, I am. Oh, that was fast. Preview. Okay. Can y'all see that? Can y'all see my screen? Who else is there? Um, Oh, you, Leela's going for her NCLEX in a couple of days, in a few days, super nervous. you got this, boo. You have got this. Make sure you utilize all the resources that's already in the study bar community. Um, we have tons of as far as practice questions. We have like 15 plus videos as far as NCLEX Jeopardy for you um, so you can take. And we just uploaded a new video um, called um, How to Pass the NCLEX on Your First Try. So make sure you check that out. It's about two hours long, but it's filled with wonderful information. So that coupled with this, how to answer select all the reply questions is definitely going to um, help you at least make you go in there, uh, make you feel more confident. Mm -mm -mm. Um, tomorrow, hello, I'm a previous nursing student. It's my turn, period. It's your turn. All right, claim it. This is definitely your turn and your season. Okay, guys, so like I said, we are um, starting our, we're about to start our first webinar, all right? So the title and the topic that we're going to be going over today is how to answer select all that apply questions, all right? SATA, you guys will probably see that like on social media, on, on the internet, wherever in your books. It's just a short version of select all that apply, also known as multiple response. Okay, wait, hold on. How you doing? I have to make it bigger. No, I'll, I'll make it like that. Okay, cool. Um, perfect, perfect. All right, so we're going to go through our um, slideshow. 
if you guys have any questions, please put it in the chat and I will answer it as soon as I see it. There's also going to be um, um, a section right before we get into the practice questions where we can go ahead and kind of have like a Q&A just in case you guys have um, any more questions that you need um, clarified and answered before we actually go into um, applying the tips and tricks and the strategies that I'm about to share with you guys. Okay, so if you guys are ready to get started, give me a thumbs up. And let's do this thing. Give me a thumbs up if you are ready to get started with the tips, tricks, and strategies of how to answer select other apply questions. SATA or multiple response, however you'll see it. Give me a thumbs up. Awesome. Melissa is ready. C's ready. Give me one more. Who else is ready? Tomorrow's ready. Leo's ready. All right, let's go ahead and do this. All right, guys. So hello, or like I already said, and welcome um, all you members of the study bar community. All right, now let's go ahead and just dive right in. So what is Select All That Apply? All right, it is, like I said, our multiple response questions. On the index, we have many um, types of question forms. And one of them, one of the most uh, notorious is Select All That Apply, okay? This question type will ask you to select or check all the options that um, relate to the question that being at, relate to the information in the question and to what the question is asking. All right, so there's usually um, five to six answer choices. You guys know with multiple choice, which is our regular, um, you know, choose A, B, C, or D, one, two, three, or four. You only um, have to choose one answer. All right, now with select all that apply in multiple response, first of all, you're not going to have four answer choices for select all that apply. You're going to have at least five, maybe six. All right, depending on the question, you it typically ranges from like five to six. And the tricky thing about um, select all that apply is that you literally have to select all that apply. Okay, so it can be as little as one correct answer. I know. I think that that's one of the things that I hate the most about select all that apply because usually, at least when I took it, I was like, okay, so I know that it's multiple um, multiple response, but if it's if it is multiple response, I know I, it, it, it has to be at least two answers, right? Because if it was just one answer, it, it would just be a multiple choice, but that's not, that's not accurate. That's not true. So it can um, be as, it can be as little as one correct answer or as many as all of them. So all five or six, depending on the um, amount of answer choices you have that question, it can range from just one of them being correct or literally all, all right? Now, let's go ahead and break down the anatomy or dissect um, a select all that apply question. All right, so first of all, you have the um, stem of the question, which is actually the question. And usually it's followed, not usually, but all the time, just so you know, it's followed by select all that apply. Whenever you see that, everyone, it's like an instant eye roll, okay? But to go ahead and get comfortable with it now, because I tell, I'm telling you this now, select all that apply is not going anywhere. So it's best to just understand how to best answer um, select all of the apply questions and just really practice that over and over and over until you're ready for your NCLEX state. All right, so you have your question. All right, it's followed by the term um, select all of the apply, just letting you know that more than one, one or more answer is going to be required. And then, like I said um, in the previous slide, you have five to six possible answer choices right down here. Okay, now this is a practice problem that we will get to, all right? Um, but I just use this so I can show you guys kind of the, um, how to break the breakdown of select all that apply questions. All right, so what's the big deal about select all that apply? Um, whether you are in nursing school, um, about to take your NCLEX, it's like one of the things that you always hear is, I hate select all that apply, select all that apply sucks. Um, I took my NCLEX and I had like literally all select all apply questions and or I had select all apply questions in my um, nursing school exams and I didn't do that well. You like you always hear about it, you always hear these horror stories about it. So the big deal and why that's so important is because 
select all of the apply questions are literally all or nothing. All right, there's no partial credit that's given to you if you select, you know, majority of the correct answers. So let's say the answer is um, two, three, and, and five. If you select two and three and think you're going to get partial credit, oh, I answered two. I got, I selected two out of three correct answers. Absolutely not. <laughs> it's still a big fat zero. You don't get any points. I know it sucks. I know. But the goal is just really to make sure that you actually comprehend what the questions ask you and the, the content topic about it. So select all the uh, select all that apply questions are a great way um, for the test um, makers to really gauge whether or not you understand the content. So a lot of people when they have select all that apply or a lot more um, select all that apply, it's not necessarily because you know, you're about to fail or you're about to pass. It's most likely because, um, especially with CAT testing, which is that, um, with the um, the computer, I must have automated CAT testing. Don't bother me, one second. The A in CAT testing is, gonna bother me. Adaptive, computer adaptive, all right? So if you are taking a lot of sec that apply questions and you for some reason maybe get those types of questions, you know, wrong, they're gonna give you more. Just to really under, make sure that they are confident in the fact that you know, not necessarily how to answer select that apply, but you know how to, um, um, that you understand the content and comprehend whatever the, um, question is asking you. So they're going to give you a lot more select that apply because the, honestly, there's really very little, I won't say there's no other way, but it's one of the best ways to really gauge whether or not you comprehend the material. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into reasons why students get those select all that apply questions right. I know, yikes. Let's get into reasons why students get those select all that apply questions wrong. Okay, let me move my face. Sure, up here, great. All right, one, like I said before, they didn't select all the correct answers, all right? Uh, majority doesn't count, almost doesn't count, it, none of it counts. It's full, select all the apply. I read something that was like, you have to really do what the question's asking, select all that apply, not select some that apply, not select the majority of that apply. And I was like, first of all, rude. <laughs> <laughs> Second of all, like we get it, <laughs> you have to select literally all that apply. So if it is four of this, it's four out of the maybe five or six that are correct, you have to select all four. You won't get partial credit. Um, it's a great way to go back and look and be like, oh, I almost got it. Or, you know, I chose this one instead of this one. It's a great um, uh, question form to just go back and look over the rationale. like. I really stress looking over the rationale on any question, but especially select all that apply, and especially if you get it wrong. We have to get it right too, but especially if you get it wrong, so that when you see it again, or maybe see um, another type of question that's similar, whether it's the same content um, topic or not, you'll know um, how to answer that question. All right, um, number two, students second guess their answers. I don't that's on any question type, but especially select all that apply because there's just so much writing on getting it correct. So a lot of people will let like test anxiety and the fact that, oh my gosh, if I don't choose all however many correct answers, like I'm going to get it wrong. If I get it wrong, I'm going to fail this test and I fail this test. Like I'm never going to be a good nurse. It, your mind just spirals. So a lot of time that test anxiety will make you go back and either choose a different question, uh, choose a different answer, um, which is usually wrong. Statistically, if you go with your gut, then more times than not, that question is right, um, as opposed to picking a question from your gut, overthinking it, going through the rest of the answer choices, and like really overthinking it, and then going back and changing it, more than likely, you're probably going to get that wrong. So that's why we always stress, do not second guess yourself. You know, how, you know you studied, all right? You know you prepared for the NCLEX. Select all of the apply, multiple choice, drag and drop. It doesn't matter the type of question type. If you know that you have studied and really and, and um, properly prepared to take the NCLEX, don't let fear 
get in your way. A lot of times that's exactly what it is. It's fear. So don't overthink. The key to answering select all of the apply questions is to really read the question and think critically and not to overthink. All right, what the question is really asking. All right, you can get caught up on bits of information that has nothing to do with the questions asking you. Um, so you have to really pay attention and understand and really train your mind to really understand, okay, what is the question asking me? And just answer that. Just answer that. Don't answer no, no don't answer anything else. Just answer what the question is straight up asking you. Okay. Reason number three students don't understand what the question is asking like i just said um reading the question too fast can cause you to miss important points or just focus on the wrong thing okay um we're going to go over some um, practice questions where um, i'll give you some great examples of um what not to focus on and what to focus on okay All right, next thing. Um, so here's some tips and strategies whenever you um, face like the little ply or other multiple um, response questions. Um, whether it's on the NCLEX, um, some people, I think everyone, it, everyone's already in nursing school or out of nursing school, but they're actually incorporating select the little ply or multiple response into the entrance exams now. I know evil i know i know <laughs> so um a lot of people um especially that are taking their atits um when it turns from six to seven at the end or the beginning of june when they switch over to atit seven they're now going to have um select all the apply questions and oh they call it multiple response but they're now going to have those questions on the entrance exam which sucks but it, the earlier you get exposed to it, you know, the more time you have to practice it. So when it comes time for the NCLEX, whether that's a year from you starting nursing school as in an LPN program, uh, two to four years for um, your ADN or your BSN, you already have kind of that practice. Um, so you can understand exactly how to answer those types of questions, no matter what the content type is. All right. So tip and strategy number one. All right, read the entire question and all of the answer choices straight through. Just, re just read it straight through. Go, read at your own pace. Don't rush reading the question or the answer choices. If you need to rephrase it in your head, rephrase it in your head after you read it. Um, but whatever you need to do to really understand the question, do that. Okay, um, so what I do is I read the full question, me personally, I read the full question and then I read the um, um, answer choices one by one. Um, I don't like to kind of, um, and I don't suggest you do this either. Sometimes when we read the question, like um, we come up with the answer in our heads already. And even though that's fine, that lets you know that you know you're really understanding what the question's asking you, understand the comp the the content topic. Sometimes that can work against you, so I caution you as far as you know um, having the question be in your head and then just choosing the answer really quick. It's fine if the answer pops up or you know something that has that's synonymous or has something to do with what the question's asking. It's fine if that pops up, but just keep that there in your head until you go through and evaluate every question. Apply that to every answer choice and not just, oh, it has to be this. And then when you see it, because for example, um, I'm not gonna say example, actually, I'm wait for the practice problems. But um, if you see a question that's asking you um, to select all the apply or select multiple choices and um, something pops up, like something about like, you know, diabetes or something like that, just an example. Um, in your mind, you're gonna be like, okay, so I know that diabetes is a type one, type two, um, insulin dependent, not insulin dependent, like all these things may pop up into your head. And if for some, if for some reason you see that in one or two of the answer choices, it can throw you off. Especially if it's in the beginning, a lot of people will not read all the answer choices and they'll just you know, get to number two and just see you know, exactly what popped up into their mind as far as the answer goes and just like to 
angle and go about the business. One, you're forgetting that it is like a little apply. So you have to literally go through all the answer choices and select all that apply, all that are um, that confirm whatever the, the question's asking. And um, yeah, my best advice would definitely be to make sure you read everything from the question to the answer choices. And if you need to read it again, read it again. OK, before answering. But if you just need to read it once and you kind of kind of got it, go right ahead. But definitely at first I was reading those things two times just to make sure I understood what it was. Um, tip number two, rephrase as true or false. You guys may or may not have heard this tip or um, trick before, but I live by it. I love it. It's how I got through. It's like a little plot. But. Um, what this actually um, means and wants you to do and how best to kind of utilize this so that it's in your favor is you want to ask yourself if the answer choice is true or false, yes or no, um, and if it's relating to what, and if it's answering what the question is asking. Okay, so really the, the big thing is to really understand what the question is asking um, and then everything else, the answer choices, you want to go through them one by one and ask, okay, is this true or false? Is this true or false? Is this true or false? Um, what I will say about um, rephrasing questions as true or false is that sometimes you have, um, I'll, I call it double negative questions, but um, for example, if you have a question that is asking you to select um, all that apply, um, let me actually move run that back. If you have a question that's asking you to um, select the answers that best, what am I trying to say? Um, oh, if you have a question that's saying, um, which of these um, will let the nurse know that further teaching is reading? That's what I'm needed. That's what I'm trying to say. If further teaching is needed, and that's a phrase, write it down if you need to, that's a phrase that all, um, you're gonna see, period. You're gonna see that on either NCLEX, your exams, all right? That's letting you know, whenever you see that further teaching is needed, you know that the, the answer that you're looking for is a false answer. And a lot of times, you know, when we're taking tests, we're obviously looking for the correct answer. So um, one of the things that we can get tripped up in is, is as we finish reading the question, and then we read that um, needs further teaching, patient needs further teaching, which of these will let you know as a nurse that the patient needs further teaching. Um, that will, um, as we read the first one, maybe we'll still have it in our head, but by like the second or third one, um, we're already saying, you know, you're, you're already looking for the correct answer. You're already checking, okay, which ones are true? Let me not say correct, which ones are true? When remember, whenever it says, you know, further teaching is needed, you're looking for a statement or an answer choice that's reflecting something that's not true. And like I said, a lot of times you get you'll get caught up because the default whenever answering questions is that you're looking for the right answer. But for this one, we're looking for the false answer. So that's when you would go but go through each one one by one and be like, okay, this person needs further teaching. You read the first statement. You will ask yourself, okay, is this true or false? If the answer is true, then you know that's not the answer. Because once again, you're looking for something false. Same thing with two, three, four, five, six, however many questions it is, how many question um, choices it is. Ask yourself, is this true or false? Is it yes or no, depending on how they asked it. And everything that has the false next to it, okay, this is false, this is false, this is false. Those are most likely the answers to, the, um, to that question, depending on, you know, what else the question was asking. Okay, I just want to make sure. Okay, cool. Um, okay, cool. So yes, refer, rephrase as true or false. My bad, I got a call. <laughs> um, third tip and strategy. Note the answers or the answer choices that are opposite or conflicting. This is a big one. This is a big one. We go through this. Um, we at least have one of these questions every time we have like NCLEX Jeopardy. Um, and I give this tip every time. 
Note the answer choices that are opposite or conflicting. For example, um, if A says tachycardia and B says bradycardia, it's going to be one or both. It's going to be one, not both. Okay, so that's even that's a little tip to help you eliminate answers that it could possibly not be, um, just so you don't you know confuse yourself or like I said overthink. Um, you can't have tachycardia and bradycardia at the same time. It's just which one is it? It's one of the other, love. It's one of the other. So when you see questions like that or question or answer choices like that where the um where they're opposite or they're conflicting, that's um almost like an easy little hint and an easy tip for you guys because it's letting you know that one of these are most likely true. It's up to you to decide which one it is. Too fast, too slow, on, off, you know any type of opposite answers is most likely going to be one of those, but it cannot be both. All right. So keep that in your mind when you're answering them. Don't choose one or the other. I mean, don't choose both. Choose one or the other because they are opposites. All right. Next tip and strategy. All right. So this one's four. All right. Watch out for those absolutes. Watch out for those absolutes. Now, whenever you're taking NCLEX, and this can apply to um, any type of question, but whenever you're um, answering like the little apply questions or NCLEX questions, period, you want to avoid absolutes. So any answer choice that says like, always, never, and all, NCLEX doesn't really like absolutes, okay? It doesn't like it at all, especially because in NCLEX world, everything is perfect. We have perfect staff. We are fully staffed. We are fully stocked on everything. Um, so it's a perfect world in NCLEX. So, you know, always, never, and all are big red flags um, as far as, you know, um, choosing answer choices and selecting those answer choices. Whenever you have like always, never, and all, it's usually um, eliminating the possibility of um, hmm. well, it's in NCLEX world, it's perfect. But whenever it's asking those questions, you want to watch out for the apps, the always, never, and all, because always, never, and all are usually going towards you know something as far as like the sickness goes. And um, whenever you're answering NCLEX questions, remember to keep client safety in mind. So whenever you have a question that's saying you know like um, it's never like oh always close the door. It's never it's, it's never something like that. It's always um, always it's always something like always take the medication. I'm trying to give you an example. Always take the medication, you know, with water, something like that. But, you know, it's a medication where it really doesn't matter if it's just water, you have to take it with fluid. Um, so that's just an example of how like always, never, and all can kind of throw you off. And a lot of people will overthink always, never, and all because, um, Sometimes when it'll give you those questions and that include always, never, and all, more than likely, more than usual and more than likely, it's something that's not absolute. It's something that with a little bit more flexibility. So that's why you should always watch out for absolutes, whether that's select all that apply or any type of NCLEX review, any type of NCLEX question. Watch out for those absolutes. Eliminate them as you see fit. Um, Obviously, if it's like an absolute, like, never kill the patient. I mean, obviously, but you're never going to get an answer like that. <laughs> you're never going to get an answer towards like that. Um, the final tip that I have for you guys is note, this is kind of like the opposite of the one that I was just telling you about, but the answer choices that are connected. This is definitely going to help you. All right. So knowing the answer choices that are conflicted slash opposite is going to help you um, do an educated, I wouldn't say educated guess, it'll help you eliminate the ones that just don't need to be there. And then the answer choices that are connected. Um, this example is wrong. I didn't get to change that. But an example of um, answer choices that are connected, I would say um, like for dehydration, if, so, so if the question's asking you, you know, about the um, I don't know, signs and symptoms of dehydration, you know that um, um, like dark urine would be connected to um, 
like a low low urine specific gravity. Does that make sense? I don't know if you guys took that yet in whatever, wherever you are in nursing school, but dark urine, concentrated urine is connected and very similar to the fact that that urine specific gravity is low. It's literally the same thing. That urine is not gonna be dark and concentrated unless urine specific gravity is low. So whenever you see something like that, you would choose both answers. Um, so if you choose one, don't forget to choose the other because they have similar cause and the same effect. Does that make sense? Woolies. All right, so with that being said, let's go ahead and practice. Let's practice these tips and tricks um, that we just learned. First of all, do you have any questions for me before we go on? Any type of um, what select the little apply or just questions at all? Do you have any questions for me? If so, write them. Wait, hold on. Okay, yeah. Does anybody have any questions? You write them in your um, write them in the comments, and I will get right to them. We can answer. Um, if not, type "Let's practice" so we can go over and go on to our practice questions. Does anybody have any questions? If you do not have any questions, type let's practice in the chat so I know you guys are ready to move forward. And obviously, as we practice these um, like the little apply questions, we're going to go over, you know, the rationale step by step. And any questions that arise after that, go ahead and feel free to ask me. But um, I just want to make just kind of come to a checkpoint and make sure that you guys are good to go. It looks like everybody's like, let's go. All right, so these questions are from, just in case um, you guys have not utilized NCLEX Arcade, but if you need more um, practice, this is the printed version, but you guys get the digital version and the full um, six videos as member included as members of the um, study bar community. So if you like the questions that we're about to do, you guys can totally, um, there's about 200 questions at NCLEX Arcade. Um, you guys can totally practice more after we get through the ones that we have, but they are pulled from NCLEX Arcade, which is included with your membership. All right. Now, this is the question that we saw earlier um, where we were talking about the, let me move my head. Okay, when we were talking about the um, anatomy of the cycle of apply question. So let's go ahead and read this together and I'm gonna give you guys a minute to put your answers in the comments, okay? So this question is asking, which food or foods Princes S, so you know. <laughs> Which foods should the nurse encourage the patient to monitor intake while on warfarin? Select all that apply. Is it one, apricots, two, kale, three, green tea, four, sauerkraut, five, turnip greens, turnip greens, or six, raisins, and or six raisins. Remember, this is like the apply. It can be as little as one answer that's correct or as many as all six. So what is your answer? Type in the comments below. Type it in the chat. Let me know what your answer is. All right. Tomorrow says two, three, five. C says two, three, four, and five. Leela, two, three, and five. Melissa and Lacola, we're waiting for you. We're waiting for you. What? What's your answers? Tomorrow, give me, give me your final answer. Give me your final answer. Is it two, three? Two, three, and five tomorrow, or are you saying two, three, four, and five? Type your final answer. Two, 
type your final answer. We got tomorrow, we got C, Lila, Lacola, Melissa. All right, so we're just waiting on tomorrow's final answer. Put your final answer in here so I know. Okay, you saved your first answer. All right, so let's go ahead and get to the rationale. All right, so the answers are two, three, four, and five. So on the NCLEX, C would have gotten it. Tomorrow, you were so close. Um, I think only, yeah, only C would have gotten it. Everybody else, um, you either missed one, or at least everyone got <laughs> a correct answer if that makes sense like no one chose a wrong answer so then that's good <laughs> so um four is always tricky and I, ooh, it, it, it got me too it got me too all right so let's go back to the question which food should the nurse encourage the patient to monitor intake while on warfarin sorry select like out to apply all right so let's go through it one by one apricot all right, first of all, let's go back to the question. Which food should the nurse encourage the patient to monitor intake while on warfarin? So you guys know with warfarin, you have to um, monitor your intake of vitamin K. Vitamin K is found in abundance in green leafy vegetables. All right, so keep that in mind. Yes, you did. Yeah, I just said you got this from NCLEX Arcade. So keep that in mind. Green leafy vegetables, okay? Apricots. Is that green or leafy? No. The thing, the tricky part about apricots, though, just in case you didn't know, is that apricots are high in potassium K, all right? Not vitamin K, all right? Um, so a lot of people will confuse the vitamin K mixed with the, the chemical symbol for potassium, which is K. They'll just see the K and be like, oh, oh, good, apricots. But no, I'm glad nobody did that. Apricots are high in potassium, but not vitamin K. And it's also not green or leafy, so out with number one. Number two, kale. Is kale green and leafy? The answer is yes. Kale is a green leafy that is also high in vitamin K. Um, number three green tea. I'm looking, to see, I'm looking to see who all got three. Green tea. Green tea is good. So a lot of people, um, when we first answered this question, um, okay, fine, me. <laughs> I'll just use me for example. I'll let y'all know. Listen, I'm not perfect, but I practice, all right? And I know, um, and I'll go back and see what I got wrong. But originally, I didn't choose green tea. Is it green? Yes. And then I was like, oh, wait, green tea. It's usually from leaves. If it's green tea, then it's a green leaf, which would obviously apply. So green tea is actually something that they would um, monitor and take on um, for sauerkraut. Now, this one was good. This one was tricky because I don't know about y'all. Like, I used to work in a restaurant, and I saw the sauerkraut. It was definitely not green. It was like gray, silver, whitish, whatever you want to call it. And I was like, ah, sauerkraut. That's that's obviously not green or leafy. But what is sauerkraut? It's cabbage. It is cabbage. And cabbage is a green and leafy vegetable. <laughs> I know. I know. I know, right? So yes, sauerkraut is cabbage, which is a green leafy vegetable. So this would actually apply. And then turnip greens. Green is in the name, turnip greens, similar to collard greens. Um, once again, let the name help you, green and leafy. Melissa's like, it is absolutely. Sauerkraut is definitely from cabbage. It's definitely from cabbage. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So just in case you didn't know what sauerkraut was, you know it now. You know it now. And it's just that color because it's cut. <laughs> um, Yes, we just went over turnip greens and then raisins. Raisins aren't green nor leafy. Raisins are like shriveled up grapes or something like that. Neither green nor leafy. Leafy. So raisins and apricots is out. Two, three, four, and five are the correct answers. Wasn't that a good one? Isn't that a good one? So look, now you know now. 
the antics I can get y'all because y'all know what South Carolina is. Y'all gonna be mad as hell. <laughs> If you get a question and it don't have sauerkraut. I know for me, I was like, ooh, listen, I know what sauerkraut is now. I'm ready for these questions. But just in case you see it again, now you know, because it's my super short show. Awesome. All right. Y'all ready to go to the next one? Next practice question. All right. What side effects should the nurse instruct the patient beginning a new prescription of lisinopril? to report immediately. Select all that apply. Is it one, if you have a nagging cough? Two, if you feel lightheaded and your blood pressure is 90 over 60? Three, if you have nausea? Four, if your tongue feels tingly or your mouth feels swollen? Or five, and or five, if you have generalized weakness? select all that apply. Let's get back to the question. It's asking us for the side effects that the nurse, that's us, should instruct the patient, this is during patient teaching, that's beginning a new prescription of lisinopril. What kind of um, med classification is lisinopril? Put in the comments right now. Put it in the comments right now. What type of med classification is lisinopril. Type it in the comments and type your answers. It is an antihypertensive, but what class? of antihypertensive. ACE inhibitor, correct. It is an ACE inhibitor. We want the specific med class. We know that it's an antihypertensive, but it's an ACE inhibitor. Specifically, and you know that because of the ending and the suffix pro. All right, anything ending in those pros are ACE inhibitors. All right, so lisinopril is an ACE inhibitor, which is a type of antihypertensive medication. So kind of knowing that in your head, um, what would be the um, side effects from starting a new ACE inhibitor type of medication that you would definitely want the um, patient to be aware of. So as y'all were doing y'all drug cards and y'all did lisinopril and it came up to nursing considerations slash patient teaching, that's what you want to, um, and side effects, that's what you want to kind of recall, if that makes sense. Um, what is it about ACE inhibitors that definitely stands out? Give me your answers. C says two and four, tomorrow says two and four. All right, put your answers in. Let me see what your answers are. This is select all the apply. Give me your answers. C and Tamari give me theirs. Um, Leela or Lila, Lacola. I'm waiting for you. All right, so I got I got Tamara. All right, and I got Melissa. Okay, cool. All right, so let's see what that answer is. Two and four. The answers were two and four. So great job, Tamara, Lacola, and Leela. Awesome job. And C. Great job, C. I see you too. All right, so the answer, the correct answers were two and four. You guys would have got um, full credit on that one. Um, everybody that did not choose that, um, those correct answers, literally two and four. If you chose something different or or added another one, it was a short one, misplaced, you know, maybe two with three and chose three, four, whatever, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been any credit. Remember, there's no partial credit. So let's go ahead and go through why the answers are two and four. So um, C said it earlier, um, one of the big things um, about ACE inhibitors, especially as far as like side effects, um, is cough. That, that that nagging cough, that's actually an expected side effect. 
Okay, so there's um, um, no need to report that one because remember it's asking for the um, side effects that the patient would have that they would need to report immediately. And if you have something that's expected, no need to report it. That's you, We know this is coming on because you're starting this type of medication. It's meant, not meant, but it's um, going to have the side effect, especially when you're starting a new prescription for um, ACE inhibitors. This one's the Cinepro, but so a nagging cough, um, that's not going to, <laughs> the nagging cough, A, that's remember, with, also, when you're um, answering these, you want to think about client safety, okay? When they're having to report something immediately, it's because it's a threat to their life, well-being. A nagging cough is just annoying, one. <laughs> I know, it's just annoying. You don't want to add too much to it. You don't want to think too much into it. You don't want to be like, well, if it's a nagging cough and they have, you know, asthma or something, that's not what the question said. That's not the information that the question gave you. You don't want to go and add on different diagnoses and different elements to confuse yourself. All right. <laughs> so yes, cough is a side effect of lisinopril. So that, that part's correct. But remember, go back to asking which um, the questions, asking which one would you have to report immediately? So is that nagging cough going to be life or death? No, it's not. So there's no need to report that one immediately. Um, so that's why one was wrong. Okay, we're looking for side effects that you have to report immediately. Remember, read the whole question, not just side effects, but side effects that you have to report immediately. Two says, if you feel lightheadedness and your blood pressure is 90 over 60. All right, so we know with, um, this is an antihypertensive med. We know that pretty much any antihypertensive med, one of the adverse effects, side effects would be the opposite of the intended effect, okay? So if the um, purpose of this medication is to bring down, well, I'm, I'm going to say opposite. If the purpose of lisinopril is to bring down your um, blood pressure, sometimes um, it can have like a rebound effect and either make it go really high, aka it's not working, or it may go really work really down, letting you know that it's working a little bit too well. It's, that's letting you know maybe you have a dosage issue. Okay, um, so if you have, you know, lightheadedness and that blood pressure is 90 over 60, A, that lightheadedness can lead to injury. Okay, um, that's why hypotension is, is a safety concern. They can usually fall um, and injure themselves. Remember, client safety, think about that. And because it's huge on safety. All right. So if you're if you're feeling lightheaded and you're feeling about to pass out everywhere in the middle of Whole Foods and Chick-fil-A, report that. Mm -hmm. Report that immediately. You must report that low blood pressure. More than likely, they're going to go and adjust that dose because if it's dropping your blood pressure that much, then it's probably the dose is probably too high. They need to adjust the dose. All right, um, so two was correct. Three, if you have nausea. Now y'all know, y'all know, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea <laughs> is a side effect for any drug. N slash V slash D. Oh, I don't know if y'all still do um, drug cards, but back when I was in, I know y'all do. Well, back when I was in nursing school, oh my gosh, literally for every drug, it was like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. We just got tired of just typing out and writing out nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and just putting NVD, NVD. But nausea is an expected side effect, literally for any drug, honestly, literally for any drug. Um, so um, that nausea is just being nauseous, once again, it's gonna be uncomfortable, but it's not going to be something that you have to report immediately. Um, so three was wrong. Four, if your tongue feels tingly or mouth feels swollen. So there's two things, when I think about ACE inhibitors, there's two things that pop into my head that I keep in the corner whenever they're asking me questions about side effects, um, about lisinopril. I keep um, cough and angioedema in my head, okay? I keep it in my head. Now, I'm not automatically looking for it because I don't know what the rest of the question's asking, but I know that to be true about ACE, inhibitor, yeah, ACE inhibitors, angioedema and nagging cough. So if your tongue feels tingling or mouth feels swollen, 
that's angioedema swelling of the tongue that can leave out, all right? That can very clearly be an airway issue, ABCs, airway breathing circulation. All right, so if that um, mouth feels swollen, that tongue feels tingly, that can, if that goes on, that angioedema can um, interfere with your airway, okay? Um, similar to like when you're having um, like an anaphylactic reaction to something and that tongue swells and like blocks that airway, same thing. Not saying that they're allergic to this drug um, because once again, we know because we were studying for the anglics, we, we've been through it. We, we, we did our ACE inhibitor, specifically lisinopril um, drug card. We know that angioedema um, is, especially of the tongue, is a um, side effect of lisinopril. So we're going to keep that in mind. Now, if there's another drug and the angioedema um, of the tongue was not um, a side effect, an expected side effect, um, well, I wouldn't say expect it, just know it's, it's there because whether it's expected or not, if it happens, you got to report it because it can interfere with your airway. All right, so that's why four is correct. That can create um, more than injury, you create death. All right, you don't want you don't want to be without air. And then five says if you have generalized weakness. Generalized is kind of like the key word here. Um, remember, ACE inhibitors, it lowers the blood pressure. So whenever you have um, a medication that's lowering that blood pressure, the rest of your body generally is going to feel a little weak. You can have generalized weakness, okay? Um, I can see how, Melissa, I can see how you chose five as far as the generalized weakness, because, you know, if you have weakness, um, you would probably think about, you know, falling when you're trying to ambulate or something like that. But this says, generalized weakness, not weakness in the legs. You don't know where they have that specific weakness. You don't know what areas are more weak than others, but that just that generalized weakness, it's almost very similar to like generalized malaise. Okay, they're just, they feel weaker than usual and that's because their blood pressure is literally trying to be, it's decreasing. So it's trying um, to get back to a safe level. But once again, when you're starting this new prescription about the Cinepril, you know that generally, it's just going to make you feel weak that, because that's just the effects that having a low blood pressure is going to have. You're welcome. No problem. All right. So great job. I bet you I won't forget. I bet you I won't forget ACE inhibitors now. Okay. Let's go into our next question. All right. Question number three, which statements indicates further teaching? is needed for a patient learning to correctly perform pursed lip breathing. Select all that apply. Now, before y'all answer this, further teaching, what did I just say about further teaching? If we're, if we're trying to, um, the question's asking us to choose the statement or statements that indicates further teaching, we are looking for statements that are false. Keep that in your head. Keep that in your head. So as you go through one, two, three, four, and five, ask yourself, is this true or false? If it's true, it's not the answer. If it's false, make a little star, all right? So one, I breathe in for two seconds through my nose only. I don't know if y'all did this, but when I first had this question, I literally like did purse breathing and, and like, I was like, Like I did it, so I can kind of, because like I said, I'm a virtual and um, kinesthetic learner. So sometimes I have to act out the things, okay? Best believe I was acting out things when I was taking my NCLEX. I wasn't talking, but if it required something like an exam, or whatever, and especially if it's on my body, but best believe I had a question about breast exam. I, I surely was like this in my chair, surely was. So if you need to do that in order to kind of get a more, um, clear picture about the correct way to perform purse lip breathing, go all out, all right? So one says, I breathe in for two seconds through my nose only. True or false? Two, I breathe in for two seconds with my lips pursed. True or false? Three, I breathe in for four seconds through my nose only. I'm going to pause you right there. One and three 
are saying the same thing, but with different times. So remember I said about that tip, if something is conflicted, then more than likely it's one of them, not the other. So one says a breathe in for two seconds and three says breathe in for four seconds through my nose only. All right, so keep that in mind. Four, I breathe in for two seconds using my mouth. And then five, I breathe out for five seconds through my nose only. Note that one, two, three, and four are all breathing in. And then five is the only one that's saying breathe out. Okay, so note when you're doing purse slip breathing in, in person, note when you're breathing in, what way are you breathing in? Through your nose, through your mouth, what is it? That's why I say evaluate those questions, evaluate those answer choices, all right? So one, two, three, and four are breathing in. Um, one, two, and four are for two seconds. Three is only for four seconds. And then five, which is also breathe out, but that's for about four seconds as well. So you gotta kind of note what's conflicting and what's connected. What's what? Which ones are similar? Which ones are saying the same thing? Which ones are saying the opposite, all right? Um, through your nose only, with my lips pursed, using my mouth. Those are the um, those are the endings for those questions. Okay. Um, did everybody answer? Let me see. Some more answered. C. Leela, Melissa. I feel like I'm waiting for one more person. Tamara, C. Leela, Melissa. Is it Leela or Lila? I feel like it's Lila. I keep calling you Leela. My bad. Who am I missing? One second. Lacola, where you at? Lacola was your answer. Where's your answer? Let me see. Because we're going to go on to the next. Leela changed your answer. <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead. And I don't know where Lacola's at. Lacola, where you at? Oh, she's the clothes driving. Okay, that's definitely more important. <laughs> that's definitely more important. You can just watch the replay later. Please drive safe. All right, so let's go ahead and get into what the actual question is. I meant the answers. Two, three, four, and five. Go C. I think C was the only one that got that one. Two, three, four, and five. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. Now, purse lip breathing. Okay, um, the correct way to purse lip breathe is you have to inhale through the nose for two seconds and then exhale through your mouth for four. All right, so actually you're, so how I remember that is honestly, I do it. I, I literally do it. Um, purse lip breathing is, um, a great, a great way to actually, um, where purse lip breathing is, that's really literally taught, um, I think for like emphysema patients, I believe, but I learned that technique, look at that, super anxiety. <laughs> so it's a breathing technique, all right, and it's designed to make your breathing more effective, all right, and it's, and it's literally you making your breathing slower and more intentional, like they also do it for like yoga and meditation and, and stuff like that. So um, you got to inhale through your nose, outhale, outhale, what? Exhale, <laughs> exhale through your mouth. All right, so one, it says, I breathe in for two seconds through my nose only. Wait, hold on. Wait. I feel like it should have been one. One second. Is that true or false? Oh, sorry. See, look. Oh my God, I just confused myself. I literally just confused myself. I was like, what? Number one is true. We're looking for further teachings. So we're looking for the false answers. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Melissa, because me, you see how I was like, true or false? Further teaching. All right. So one is false because it's true. Does that make sense? Remember, we're looking for the false answer. And as we go through um, each one, we ask ourselves, is this true or false? We're looking for the false one. So one is I breathe in for two seconds through my nose only. That's a true statement. So that's actually wrong. So one is wrong. Two, 
I breathe in for two seconds with my lips pursed. Is that true or false? That's false. First of all, one and two are saying the same thing, but they're opposite. So we know it has to be one or the other. All right, so future teaching is needed on this one. You inhale through the nose for two seconds, not through the mouth, which is your lips pursed through the mouth. All right, so two is correct because it's false. Three, I breathe in for four seconds through my nose only. You breathe in through your nose, yes, but you only do it for two seconds, not four. So that one will require further teaching. So that's correct. Four, I breathe in for two seconds using my mouth. That's false because we breathe in for two seconds through our nose. One and four are opposite answers. One is I breathe in for two seconds through my nose. Four is I breathe in for two seconds using my mouth. Opposite. So it's going to be one or the other. In this case, it was four because it's wrong. And then five, I breathe out for four seconds through my nose only. That one's incorrect because you breathe out with your pursed lips, with through your mouth. Okay, so you breathe out for four seconds, correct, but it's not through your nose. So that's why that one's correct, because it's false. Ooh, that was a good one. Two, three, four, and five. Awesome job to everybody that got that. Practice really makes perfect, honestly, because how long have I been doing it, especially these practice questions <laughs> with you guys? And I literally, as I went through it the first time, I was like, oh, remember, we're looking for first. I was doing all this and everything. I was being so extra further teaching don't forget and then i literally forgot <laughs> i literally forgot like i said i'm not perfect but these are why these tips and strategies as i go through it i didn't correct myself until i was like wait what let me read the question again oh it's asking for false ones because i was like wait one is correct mm -mm. case in point case in point that was a good one all right next question all right, this ends question number four. And I feel this one because I just got diagnosed ADHD <laughs> like two months ago. So I felt this one. One thing that you should probably not do, but also kind of keep in your mind, if you have something um, that you can kind of like personally relate to or one that you saw, re just remember that in NCLEX world, it's, it's, it's perfect, all right? NCLEX is a perfect world, all right? Not every, especially when you're dealing with side effects, not every person that takes medications deal with the same side effects. So don't think like, oh my gosh, I'm taking this, or I know someone that's taking this medication, and they, they, they never tell me that they have this, this, and that, or I never see this and that. Not everyone deals with medications the same way. Don't go strictly based off what the book, <laughs> the book says, all right? Now, this says, the nurse advised the parents of a 13-year-old diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, that being prescribed, um, that's being prescribed list dexamethasone, dexamphetamine, ah, list dexamphetamine, which is um, safe meth, basically. <laughs> Which information should the nurse include regarding possible side effects when conducting patient education? Select all that apply. I don't know about y'all, but that's the question I'll have to read over again because those are a lot of words. Which information should the nurse include, this is patient teaching, regarding possible side effects when conducting patient education? All right, so we are looking for the things to um, make sure the patient um, and the parents, because I mean, they're the parents um, primarily because the patient is a minor. But um, so which ones should we definitely include? Remember, think about client safety and think about the big ones that can um, either imp like impede on that client safety or just um, mm, well, besides client safety, I would say like overall well-being. Yes, overall well-being. All right. So one, heart palpitations and a nagging cough. So that be included as a possible side effect with this lex listexamphetamine. Two, hypertension. Three, insomnia and growth spurts. Four, increased appetite. Five, restlessness. Six, weight loss. All right, so we have six answer choices. 
like I said before, it can be as little as one of them that's correct or as many as all six. All right. Once again, we have a 13 year old diagnosed with ADHD being prescribed Lysdexamphetamine. All right. What type of medication? But yeah, what type slash class of medication is Lysdexamphetamine? What type is it? It starts with an S. It's a stimulant. I'm going to say it. It's a stimulant. All right. So what information or which information regarding stimulants, especially for a 13 year old, but regarding stimulants should um, should you definitely let the parent be aware of as far as possible side effects? This because your child is taking the stimulant. Remember, rephrase if you need to, because your child is taking the stimulant. These are the possible side effects that, that I want you to be aware of. OK, remember, they didn't say anything about reporting immediately. They just said what information should be included as far as possible side effects. All right. So. One, heart palpitations and a nagging cough. Two, hypertension. Three, insomnia and growth spurts. Four, increased appetite. Five, restlessness or six, weight loss. You can either go, you can also go through each of the answer choices and ask yourself, you know, um, remember the true or false, yes or no, is this a side effect of a stimulant? Heart palpitations and a cough. Is that a, and if you have something that says and, like for example, one in three, heart palpitations and a nagging cough, three is insomnia and growth spurts, both have to apply, okay? Someone said. So let's go ahead and let me see, four, two, three, four, nine. All right, let's go ahead and see what the correct answers are. Two, five, and six. Two, five, and six. Okay, so nobody got that one. Tomorrow was close, but you, you chose one. You chose number one. Um, Leela, you were close, you chose four instead of two. Melissa, you were close. You chose one instead of six. Let's go ahead and get into it. All right, so one, heart palpitations and a nagging cough. Now, with the stimulant, stimulants are literally meant to stimulate your body. All right, so it's it's literally going to stimulate every aspect of your body, heart rate, um, breathing rate, like your, your activity, all of that. Ooh. Tomorrow, I can't wait for you to tell me that. Oh, I can't wait for you to tell me that. All right, so um, yes, heart palpitations. That's definitely going to be a um, side effect. Your heart is being stimulated to, to pump faster, okay? Um, so heart palpitations may occur, but that nagging cough, that's not a side effect. That's from the Cinepro. That's the Cinepro. That's the Cinepro, okay? Mm -mm. So that's why one is, um, is not correct. See, and I just, I've never had it on my life, literally for the past year. And I'm just like, what the hell is happening? Oh, I can't. I'm so glad y'all said that because a lot of people, nursing students, suffer from ADHD, whether they know it or not. Um, and also, oh, okay, I'm going to just go ahead and say it. And also, the stress, it's the stress from nursing school, If it's, that's why I'm really big on making sure people enjoy nursing school, enjoy studying because the stress from nursing school can literally burn out your adrenals, literally burn out your adrenals and you can develop ADHD. If you're under like constant stress, whether it's for 12 months for LPN or four years for nursing, if you are on constant stress, you're more than likely gonna burn out your adrenals and have very similar, um, very similar symptoms like ADHD and sometimes even develop it. Absolutely. Absolutely. My stress didn't come from nursing school. My stress came from this business. <laughs> uh, it came from my business. Okay. But it still manifested in ADHD. Like as a three-year-old adult, I'm like, what? I thought that was only something that, you know, that you're supposed to get as a, a little kid and they don't tell you that in nursing school. <laughs> um, but okay, well, trust me, we'll go over that. All right, so yes, um, one is correct. No, one is wrong because heart palpitations 
transportation is quite nagging cough is it so one's out two hypertension that is a side effect of once again a stimulant remember your if your if your heart's beating fast then more than likely your blood pressure is also going to be up because the more I think of it like a water slide if y'all have ever been with me for NCLEX Jeopardy um, I think of um, blood vessels as a water slide the more and the faster like the water goes through that water slide or through those vessels the higher the um the blood pressure is going to be because the pressure of the water in the slide or the blood vessels are increased so blood pressure will increase aka hypertension so that's why two is um correct um three insomnia and growth spurts the and that and will get you so insomnia definitely because let me tell you i've been up for two days <laughs> And I just cannot, not literally, not this time, but last week, yes. That insomnia will definitely, definitely occur. Why? Because you're being stimulated <laughs> to stay up. So it really sucks sometimes. Um, so that insomnia may occur, most likely, to be honest. But that growth spurt, you actually, um, yeah, that growth spurt's not, that's not a side effect at all. Mm -mm. Um, I'm trying to think if your growth will be stunted hold on and then let me look growth stunted with stimulants google it's free and 24 7. all right so stimulant medication does not affect final height um as adults kids whatever um it won't stunt their growth nor will it make their growth spurt. Yeah, sure. So stimulants have nothing to do with height, period. <laughs> so even if that said growth stunted versus growth, you know, be um, your growth, you know, spurt, it'll be incorrect because it has nothing to do with height and it does not affect height. All right. So just in case you didn't know that, because I did not, it's not covered. <laughs> now you do. All right. So that is why three is out. Four, increased appetite. That not I know that one to be um, wrong because stimulants actually decrease the appetite. And I know you probably think, oh my God, stimulate stimulants, it's gonna stimulate your appetite. But it's actually the opposite. It stimulates your body so much that it um, suppresses your appetite. Like you're 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 too busy going like this. Like it stimulates your activity, <laughs> but not your appetite. Um, does that make sense? Um, that's something I know I think just from doing my from a from personal experience and from um, my study cards they definitely do let you know about the appetite part so um, a decreased appetite is actually the side effect and a lot of times um, like the doctors will not especially if you have a child or an adult that is um, they have a low weight they'll actually either not um, not prescribe that stimulant because they know that um, the, the appetite's gonna be suppressed. So if anything, they're probably going to lose more weight and that's not what you want. <laughs> you, you, that's not what you want. So um, a lot of times those stimulants aren't prescribed unless the child, adult, whatever, whoever, is at a healthy weight just in case there's some, you know, especially when you're first taking it, there's some, um, fluctuation and, and your body's getting adjusted to that medication. So sometimes, you know, you're, you just won't feel the need to eat because your body's being stimulated so much, but your appetite's not stimulated, just your body functions. Um, Fivelessness, like I said, you like this. <laughs> so restlessness and um, insomnia are pretty much synonymous. And like I said, the uh, three was wrong because of the growth spurt part, not the insomnia part. So insomnia and restlessness, very similar. All right. If you're very restless, you're not going to go to sleep, especially if it's at nighttime. <laughs> also, don't be like me and take your stimulant medications at 6 p.m. at night. Don't do it. <laughs> you will never go to sleep. <laughs> and then six, weight loss. I just talked about this. So four and six are opposites. 
All right. If you have a weight loss, more than likely it's because you're not eating. Well, in this in this case, it's because you're not eating. So if if weight loss is the answer, then increase appetite, which we we'll call weight gain, that would not be the answer. So that's kind of that's what I mean when I say, you know, make sure you're watching out for answers that are similar and connected and answers that are conflicted. Increased appetite, weight loss. Those are conflicting. Okay. I can't have an increased appetite and lose weight. I wish. I wish, but it don't work like that in these streets. It does not. <laughs> so weight loss is a big side effect of the medication, just like the story I told you. They won't do it. They won't prescribe it unless you're at a healthy weight because they know there's a good possibility that you're going to lose some weight. Good possibility. All right. Um, great. So, yes. Uh, two, five, and six are the correct answers. Hold on, tomorrow. Let me see what you said. Fell down his game at one point. Hold on, because your 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 director didn't have to do that. I know that every team member tried to give me tests as a kid, but mom didn't want to. That's crazy. Director told me you didn't want to be. You don't want to be ADHD as a nurse. You would be targeted as having to do this twice as slow. What? I went to see help because I was struggling my whole life. I reached out because I was thinking to. Yo. Okay, tomorrow. Oh, I cannot wait to have this talk with you. Oh, I can't wait to have this talk with you. So first of all, oh, that makes me so mad because I know exactly how you feel because it literally took me like a year to find somebody to actually A, listen to me, and then B, prescribe me the medication. However, when I worked um, for family medicine and I worked in a doctor's office, all the counterparts, they, they were just, and a lot of them were nurses. So your director is actually very wrong. Like the reason why I knew, honestly, the, the first people that I um, um, seen, especially outside of being a kid, like adult wise that had ADHD were nurses, which is really funny. <laughs> very high, um, they worked in very like high acuity jobs, not just nurses, but just like lawyers, nurses, like um, business CEOs. And that's because once again, the burnout from having such a high stress job will make you, <laughs> it would honestly make you either have ADHD or, or um, um, you'll get some symptoms and start to develop um, the symptoms of ADHD, be very close. And that's from those adrenals burning out from that constant stress. So your director is totally false, okay? As far as you having to be targeted, you won't be, especially if you're treated, you won't be targeted for nothing. If anything, they'll be like, oh, she's on her game because look, I had the nurses that I um, were, that I were, um, that was giving those prescriptions to, they were just ED nurses, ICU nurses, whatever, wherever they were. But I, there was so many and quite a few. Honestly, shame on your director. That's crazy. And for shaming the fact that, you know, people with ADHD, whether you're a kid or 80 or adult, trying to make you seem like you're lazy. Absolutely not. That's not what ADHD is. And as a director, she should know that. Or he or she, he or she should know that. Give me their number. Give me the address. I got you. All right. Next question. Oh, I'm going to do a post. I'm going to do a post right on that. Just because you said that. I didn't know that, um, like I said, I just recently got diagnosed with ADHD. So this wasn't a problem for me in nursing school, but now that I look back, it was a problem for so many different people. And they really thought that it was like, maybe it's just not meant for me to be a nurse. And that's not what it is. It's not because you're lazy. It's literally because <laughs> your adrenals are burnt out. So you literally cannot sit here and read through a hundred pages. Ooh, that is I got goosebumps. That just made me so mad. You literally cannot sit here and retain and recall all that, you know, all that information just because you because you have, you know, ADHD. That's insane. And some people have it all their life. Some people's just been suffering. Um, um, just they get it in their adulthood. But that does not, you know, make that doesn't reflect on you as a person and your work ethic. Oh, that makes me so mad. It makes me so mad. But yes, I'm going to do a post. All right. Fifth question, guys. Which drug administration would require an incident report? Now, this is important because we all know people going to jail over these incident reports. So which drug administration would require an incident report? 
select all and apply. All right, so we have five answer choices here. Um, one, doxorubicin hydrochloride. IV <laughs> held for a patient with 30% ejection fraction. Two, fluoxetine given for a patient with depression who stopped tranalcipramine two days ago. Um, three, sumatriptan held for a patient reporting migraines with a blood pressure of 177 over 92. Four, lactulose, given to a patient with a serum potassium level of 2.5. Um, five, warfarin given to a patient with deep vein thrombosis and an INR of 3.5. This is a good one because I don't know about y'all, but I don't, I don't, I don't know what number one is. <laughs> like, I don't know what doxorubicin is. Like, most likely they did like a, a card on it, but you're not gonna remember every medication all the time. You're just not. Majority of these I know. Fluoxetine, sumatriptan, lactulose. And you can kind of go through each one and ask yourself, okay, what is this medication? What is the purpose of this medication? Um, and then it's usually, and then like one, for example, doxorubicin hydrochloride that IV is held for a patient with 30% ejection fraction. So I'm assuming it has something to do with the heart. I don't know. Let's look it up while y'all answer. <laughs> Doxo. I don't know. And whenever I have these questions, I literally, uh, I'll go through it and talk to myself, whatever, whatever. And, um, and then afterwards, I'll research the medication, especially if I don't know what it is, because that's literally the whole point of view. It's it's chemotherapy, my bad. I said it has something to do with the heart. I would be wrong. Um, but yes, doxorubicin is a chemotherapy to, like, for what, though? Oh, it just says anti-cancer agent. Okay, sure. Sure. But anyway, just so you know what it is. All right, five, two, four, two, and I didn't know what, what it's. I just listen, I didn't know what one was two, but I just let you know. It's an anti-cancer agent. So now you know. Now we both know. <laughs> All right. Is that everybody? Tamora. Let's see, Leela. Melissa, where you at? You driving too? Oh, two, five. All right, let's go ahead and see what this answer choice is. I'm trying to remember what it was. Two, four, and five. Great job, C. Awesome job. Okay, so yes, two, four, and five. Melissa, so close, you missed four. Tomorrow you chose one instead of four. The color you missed four. Lila, you chose like the opposite answer. You chose what was wrong. So I'm trying to see if um, um, you um, mixed, like you didn't understand what the question's asking. That one's kind of like you, you, you chose the, um, you chose the correct answers if that makes sense. All right, so let's just go ahead and break it down. So the question says, which drug administration, it's okay, that's why we do this, listen, that's why we do this practice. Which drug administration would require an incident report? Now, and so let's select all that apply. First of all, if there's a drug administration that requires an incident report, then you know it should not have been given. Something was done wrong, okay? So we're looking for an, um, one through five are all scenarios, drug administration scenarios. So we're looking for the scenario that is inappropriate, okay? One, doxorubicin hydrochloride IV is held for a patient with 30% ejection fraction. Is that inappropriate or appropriate? All right, this one, once again, the doxorubicin hydrochloride, that's a chemo drug and um, it can cause cardiac toxicity. So the ejection fraction of the heart is um, evaluated before giving that medication. Now the um, the 
ejection fraction is 30%, which is low. What's, what's normal ejection fraction? Off the top of my head, I do not know. I cannot remember. Ejection fraction. But another reason why I do these um, practice questions so that when I come across stuff, <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what this is. Let me look it up just in case I come across it again. All right, so doxorubicin should be um, discontinued or should be held if the ejection fraction is below 45. All right. Um, so this one's 30, which is below 45. So um, this drug should be held. All right. So that would not. So this is actually an appropriate um, action. All right. This drug should definitely be held. So this would not require an interim report. So one is wrong. Um, so let me just let me just look up the normal ejection fraction, not the one specific to doxorubicin. So normal is fifty to seventy-five, according to the American Heart Association, but and also according to whatever book you got. <laughs> so fifty to seventy-five. Um, either way, thirty percent is below both of those. 30% is low, all right? So you have a lower fraction, you don't want to give that medication, which is what number one is saying happened. So you don't need to do an incident report. One is, one is out. Two, fluoxetine is given for a patient with depression who stopped tranocypramine two days ago. Fluoxetine, that is a um, antidepressant, obviously. Well, I'm not gonna say obviously. It's an antidepressant and tranocyclamine Tranocypramine is an MAOI, um, MAO inhibitor, all right? Um, usually with um, MAOIs and antidepressants, you're never supposed to mix those, all right? You're supposed to wait at least, Um, no, it's uh, Melissa. Melissa said, isn't that wrong because it shouldn't have been stopped like that? Um, it's wrong because it's not a long enough time for them to stop it. I believe it's two weeks. Let me look. I think it's two weeks. Let me look. Let me make sure. Let me make sure. Um, who's really going to bother me now? Hold on. It's literally in my, hold on. Hmm. Really going to bother me. Okay. Two weeks. Ha ha. I was right. So you're supposed to discontinue an MAOI inhibitor and have discontinued it for two whole weeks before starting, um, an antidepressant SS, specifically like an SSRI. Um, which is fluoxetine. It is an antidepressive medication, but the actual specific class is SSRI, serotonin, selective serotonin re reuptake inhibitor. And with SSRIs and MAOIs, um, when they're taken too close together, aka within that two-week period, it can actually cause serotonin syndrome. All right, so them taking it for, um, stopping it for two days isn't enough time. Yeah, it's supposed to be two weeks. Great job, great job. Gotcha, gotcha. So, um, so that one is correct because it would require an incident report because they gave it under inappropriate circumstances. Three, sumatriptan, migraine med. Um, Health for a patient reporting migraines with a blood pressure of 177 over 92. All right, so that is hypertension. Um, this drug, this one's wrong, but the drug is um, held. So this is an appropriate and does not require an incident report. So um, the sumatriptan is being held, even though they are reporting migraines, but that blood pressure um, is what caused them to um, hold it. Um, the medication itself causes vasoconstriction. Now remember, y'all know my reference whenever I'm thinking about um, blood vessels. So sumatriptan can cause a blood vessel to vasoconstrict, aka get smaller. All right. So if you already have a blood pressure that's 177 or over 92, 
remember hypertension, whenever you have, um, whenever your blood pressure is high, it means the pressure of the blood and um, the fluid in those vessels um, are going faster. All right. So if the diameter of that water slide gets smaller and smaller, but the speed at which that water is going through the vessels aren't changed, then that's going to just increase the blood pressure further. All right, it's already 177 or over 92. Vasoconstricting it or vasoconstricting the blood vessels after giving that medication is just going to cause that 177 or number two just going to steady rise. And we all know the higher the blood pressure, the more like risk of like stroke, especially because one that bottom number is 92. We were taught that over like 100 and when that bottom number is over 100, it gets dangerously close to stroke level. Okay, so it's already at 92. We don't need it to go up any further. It actually needs to come down. All right. Um, so one, three would be wrong because they held it, which is an appropriate action. So three is wrong. Four, and it would not require an incident report. Four, lactulose given to a patient with a serum potassium of 2.5. All right. So lactulose, um, whenever that's given, it's given to decrease potassium. So it's usually given when someone's potassium is really, really high. Um, this serum potassium level is 2.5. Um, the normal for potassium is 3.5 to 5. Easy way for me to remember potassium is three and a half to five bananas. That's how I remember it. Um, so normal is 3.5 to 5. And right now we have a serum potassium level of 2.5, which means that serum potassium is low. If we give that lactulose, it's just gonna get lower, get even lower. So giving that with someone that already has um, low potassium would definitely require an incident report. So that one's correct. Um, five, warfarin given to a patient with deep vein thrombosis, blood clots, and an INR of 3.5. All right, so first of all, this one's correct. Iron R range um, should be two to two to three. All right, um, especially when they're on warfarin without mechanical heart valve. And they didn't disclose that to us. So um, if their iron R is 3.5 and we know it should be within the range of two to three, um, if it's over three, they're at an increased risk of bleeding. If it's less than three, then um, it's the opposite of increased risk of bleeding. Um, I guess it'll clot more. More of it will clot. Yeah, sure. Um, so yes, given that warfarin, which is a clot buster, okay, um, to a patient that's already at, um, I'm sorry, I said clot buster, it's a blood thinner, given um, to a patient with an iron eye, which doesn't know that their blood is already super thin. So above three, their blood is um, gonna be increasingly thin, and then below two, it's increasingly thick. Does that make sense? So warfarin given to a patient with already super thin blood is just going to, like, you could just go like that and they're just gonna bleed. All right, so that will require um, an incident report because they are at an increased risk for bleeding. You just made it even more uh, detrimental <laughs> um, by giving that warfarin. Remember, client safety. Okay, so the correct answers were two, four, and five. Boop, boop, boop. All right, so that is the end of our practice questions. All right, and also our webinar. Did that help you guys in any way, shape, or form? If you guys want to, um, there's a lot. There's a lot of um, NCLEX Arcade questions um, that are select all that apply. Like I said, this is the um, this is the printed version. You can all PDFs and digital downloads um, are printable if you purchase them from the website, but specifically NCLEX Arcade is um, principal for you um, in the study of our community. And you can also access the videos to um, accompany 
the uh, workbook. The workbook's like 372 pages. You can, once again, it comes digitally, but you can um, print it out if you would like. About 200 questions, and a lot of them are select out apply. So great way for you to um, practice your, um, <laughs> to the head of arcade afterwards. Awesome. Um, it's a great way for you to practice your techniques. Um, and there's some, obviously there's some multiple choice. It's multiple choice and select out apply. And I think there's a, uh, there's a few fill in the blanks. I can't remember. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Um, but either way, you have full free access included with your membership. Thank you guys so much for coming and joining me on this webinar. This replay um, will be available, um, if not tomorrow, if not later tonight, then tomorrow um, in the study bar community for anybody that wants to go back over and rewatch the webinar so you can get those tips, and, um, tips tricks, and strategies. Um, Awesome. I'm so glad it helped all you guys. Thank you guys so much. All right. So you guys be blessed. I'm also going to be putting um, like an actual, like a cheat sheet for answering sex all apply. So everything that you learned here, I'm going to be, um, oh, everything that you learned here, I'm going to be putting it in like a PDF form and uploading it to the study bar. So you can just have kind of like a cheat sheet that you can um, reference um, easier than just rewatching a almost two hour video. <laughs> okay. So thank you guys so much. Oh, tomorrow I see you're going to wear your student nurse pin. Where's mine? Boop, boop. Wait, yep. There we go. I had to do the YouTube thing. You know how they be doing this. <laughs> awesome job, guys. Um, if y'all have any questions, please hit me up in the study bar community. Send me an email, hit me up on social media. I will see y'all next time. Um, and if there's specific um, questions and topics that you guys want me to go over, I am very, very open to that. Let me know what you guys need. And I will put together the next webinar for you guys to help you guys reach your success. All right. Yay. I'm so glad this is so helpful. All right, guys. Thank you so much. And I will see y'all later.